I mean, really, what could possibly go wrong? Well, uh, we hit that one goal on Patreon, thank you all, and now I'm legally obligated to cover the mainline Persona games on pain of death, but at least we won't have to touch Dark Souls anytime soon. So we'll be covering Persona 1 and the Persona 2 duology here today. But I know all you scrimblows in the viewer's seat are thinking, Persona? Isn't that the game with the d game that you play to supplement a lack of meaningful human connection? A little bit. For the unknowers, here's the gist. Persona is a trendy JRPG with incredible art direction, an emphasis on character relations, self-discovery, and mechanics that push boundaries past whatever the genre classics are doing. But it wasn't always like that. It's worth mentioning, for the unknowers, that Persona is a spin-off of the Megami Tensei series, which I intentionally left out of Patreon polling because I do not hate myself. Don't like recording really long games for the show. Oh no! You know, I heard some stuff about the Persona fanbase, so up front, Full spoilers allowed. I have not watched or read other Persona opinions. I am not an extension of the fanbase. So rip me apart. Go wild. I don't care. But don't ever say the boy don't work. Persona 1 came to be out of SMT because the high school setting used in one of the games was popular. Honestly, bro, can't relate. There was a time, maybe 10 years ago, when the high school thing would have been cool. Relatable even, but I'm quite a bit older now, you know, have responsibilities, got a lot of bills. So frankly, when some dumbass kids act stupid on screen for 40 hours or start waxing poetic about pseudo-philosophical nonsense, I check out a bit, okay? I wrote poetry for writing class. I got told to get off my soapbox, been there, done that. It's hard to find the care. And I know the writing's coming from an adult. I know I'm on some pathological ageist crap right now. We've all got some stuff to work through. I am not immune. Kbash, for this task, you will receive a persona of an arcana best suited to your personality. Awesome! What do I get? Perhaps a persona of the fool arcana, for only a fool would engage in such a task. Okay. Oh, perhaps a persona of the hanged man arcana, because <laughs> you, you're going to be a hanged man when this is done. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got the gist. Oh, better yet, the death arcana, because by the time this is done, you'll persona be Persona, nostalgia critic. <laughs> All right, the game intros with some high schoolers summoning demons. Why? Dying is f epic. Of course it works. They summon a little ghost girl, awaken the power of JoJo stands, also called personas like supernatural alter egos tied to your soul, granted to the characters by the mysterious Philemon, and leave. Ugh, God, what is this? So you move through most dungeons with this first-person view, pretty typical for dungeon crawlers, but jeez, it takes some getting used to. Hurts my eyes. Where the hell did he get that? I'll save the plot talk for later, but you, boy with earring, good name, head out with your friends and a hand-painted background Japan map and roam the streets, going places. Sometimes, you can't really go where the game doesn't want you to. I know some people think that's a no-no, but I appreciate the attempt at a direction. I'd really love to know what year this takes place in, if only there were a holistic way to pinpoint its age. Oh, it's about that old. Okay. You run into little scenarios, make choices, run through dungeons, its skeleton isn't hard to understand, and I appreciate that, because me stupid. But unfortunately, this game's a bubbling session pit of actual evil? I mean, this is a game you can pick up right now and not realize there's a pile of missable party member options. The most plot-important missable party member requires an extremely specific set of decisions that nobody without a guide is getting, and the story features two distinct routes, which again, following the basic game directions, you'd never know existed at all. It's absurd, incredible for replayability, cool feature, totally absurd. This is the kind of game you play with a guide. I guess we can't advance without discussing the party, huh? Like I said, the party's pretty flexible, but the average new player is ending up with the silent protag, Nanjo, Mark, Maki, and other... I got brown. <laughs> Why is he called brown? Huh? He poop his pants? Huh? Nah, I'm kidding. Nanjo's fairly unremarkable, but Mark used to be black in the US PS1 version to appeal to American audiences. Which is really unfortunate, considering the, uh, tribal base persona and the game constantly calling him a monkey. And turns out, they've all got the power to summon a persona and kill demons. But because they can summon a persona, they need to change and grow as people. 
but because they're major characters in a JRPG, they already need to change and grow as people. I don't really know why I wrote this. I was definitely wasted. It doesn't really matter what characters you get. They'll make it through just fine. Combat's a little different than what you might expect, coming off the usual suspects. You've got normal attacks, guns, because why wouldn't you supply guns to high schoolers, right? Just give the kid a gun. Pow! You use persona attacks, or magic if you will, the defend command, you can just run away. It all makes functional sense. You abuse magic whenever possible and supplement with other attacks when enemies are immune. Not a huge fan of the grid system, but you can manipulate it, a little micromanagement in my complex JRPG. All right. On that note, the persona system is a little funny, right? Usually in JRPGs, your characters level up, you unlock new moves, you get better, but you don't change too much. If you're casting one kind of spell, it just gets bigger in the end. But in persona, you're incentivized not to lean on your character's main persona. You're incentivized not to lean on that reflection of yourself, but rather to take on another. So you find demons in the wild, get their spell cards, and summon them or fuse them into bigger and better personas. I think that's kind of weird narratively, like, shouldn't my main dude just grow stronger through the game, but then you wouldn't get to screw around with other demons? It's almost like a monster collector, except instead of collecting controllable friends, you're collecting alternative movesets. And it's essential to getting through the game. Those early personas leave a lot to be desired, and you can get super turbo HD personas for each character, but don't let me catch you picking the wrong obscure dialogue option in-game, or no ultimate personas for you! And really, the hardest thing to get a grip on is the contact system. System. Like, oh my god, where do I start? Okay, first up, you're gonna enter a battle with a demon you want to summon as a persona. Next, you'll use the contact command to initiate conversation instead of fighting. Then, you'll pick a bunch of options at random that you think might work, but don't, and end up pissing off the demon. Lastly, you'll open the online guide to contacts, because their personalities are totally alien, and start having fun again. I mean, seriously, there is no way to know with some of the demons. They're just too demented. That one got a schlong! Even the guide I used was wrong on occasion. Even the guide! It's like Persona 1 resists the player even trying to play it. And yeah, trial and error is a thing, a really long thing, but even your selected party members can affect what demons you can actually convince to give up their spell card. Summon ticket. Whatever you want to call it. From what I understand, you can lock yourself out of acquiring certain personas with the wrong party members. And that's locked for the whole game. It's not that big an issue, right? Just... Like, look, I'm so appreciative that demons are kind of hard to understand. It's actually a decent metaphor for trying to wrap your head around new perspectives, empathize. I'm not mad at all. Then there's the dungeons. Most are pretty inoffensive, exactly what you'd expect. Hallways and random battles, which you can die in. By the way, this ain't like the f***ing Bean Man or whatever from Dragon Quest. The demons want you dead. The toilets are exploding. Anyway, they start getting a little spicy with the spinning tiles, the fallaway floors, the fog. Rooms. Oh, I hate Vision 2. Thank you, Persona. There's even puzzles by the end. It's hard to say anything substantive about them. They're just kind of annoying. And the few rooms that dot progression are either filled with services you don't always need. Uh, okay. Whoa! Or environments you can't interact with. Look, this is a sidebar, but it was pretty disappointing trying to click on the environment only for there to be no flavor text for anything. Just, nope, nothing here. <laughs> There is definitely something there! Alright, look, in Magi Nation, on the Game Boy, there was text for everything. Give me more of that, please. Because for anyone coming from the new games, I mean, they're coming off some real high personality experiences, and it's super weird diving back into the past only to be met with nothing. Like finding out your great, 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 great grandpa sold corn. Also, at the end of this one dungeon, the boss sends you away and forces you to walk all the way back through the goddamn labyrinth of Crete. Makes you run a dungeon with only two characters later. <laughs> so, between tolerable to utterly torturous spawn rates, frequently complex dungeons, grinding for quality personas, and fairly minimal character action, at least meaningful character interaction, any real enjoyment of the plot gets kind of gummed up by raw gameplay. It's hard to remember every detail about what's going on, but thankfully most of it doesn't really matter. Like, yeah, you've got a lot of characters, but only the protag's choices, Maki and the antagonist, really matter. Nanjo, Brown, Mark, whoever your other members are, mostly bicker and have their little arcs, sure, but the story's about Maki and the antagonist. You know, I don't really feel like spoiling the entire plot, especially because there's two roots, and really the game kind of does it itself, like, oh no, our classmate Maki is in the hospital, dang, the world is full of demons, and there's this little girl running around, and Maki is here now and doesn't remember being in the hospital, and there's two little girls who look exactly like Maki. <laughs> Let's have children. 
Hmm. It's much more about the narrative of personal growth, which works. Everyone gets somewhere. Maki and her friend accept themselves. Nanjo, Mark, and Brown all grow up a bit. I'm sure the rest do, too. It's not the hardest narrative payoff to hit, though it's a little harder to sell with characters looking like this. The player grows too, or rather, the player makes a series of choices and the game shoves them in your face. If you screw up, if you don't act morally correct, you lock yourself out of the true conclusion. Personally, that's a bit of a yikes, having to replay a whole game over a text box, but there's save slots, and the game's functionally about role-playing with a group of friends trying to get better. It's a coming-of-age story, after all. So we give it a pass, even if I feel almost nothing about it. I don't know, maybe I would have felt more if the bulk of the in-game text wasn't just one-dimensional, grandstanding boy banter between between young Genki Shonen deaths. But hey, we've unlocked the final dungeon. Now to claim our reward. Every once in a while, I'm reminded that this is not my story. That I am but a speck of cosmic dust whose death will be painful but insignificant and quickly forgotten. Well, that was hell. I look back on the game a little more charitably than I sound. I think it's kind of neat, but considering where Persona ended up, it's probably not the definitive expression of the series. That's all. Oh, look, all the characters got a little epilogue. That's cute. Hold on. He really did it. That wasn't a joke. He really did it. He sh his pet. <laughs> Okay, Bash, it's me. You. No, we can't do this, Skid. It's forbidden. This isn't a Sonic 06 video. It's not like that. I am you. Your worst tendencies, your drive to succeed, even when the price is costlier than the reward. In truth, I am merely here to offer a drink. You're looking dehydrated. Thank you. Also, Sam. <laughs> what? Why? So I'm a little dumb. Sometimes I thought that Persona 2 was just that. A single game. <laughs> and in the West, there was only one Persona 2 for a while, so brief history. Persona 2 is a duology, very reminiscent of Golden Sun and The Lost Age. It's comprised of Innocent Sin, which was initially held back, only to return on the PSP, and Eternal Punishment, the follow-up, originally released for PS1. I know, makes total sense. Sarcasm aside, it really does. See, Innocent Sin featured a gay character in the party. Oh no, the West might get confused and weirdly big that other people exist. It's bigger than that. There is Atlas changing how they localized games, etc. That and all the potentially sensitive historical imagery. That's weird. Why is that there? So Innocent Sin, what's the premise? Our silent protag, Tatsuya, and his friends investigate a series of supernatural occurrences in town. It's similar to the first. You collect a party of Persona users, so people who need to work through something, all while chasing down a mysterious Joker who clearly hates the party and his various minions. It's not the most interesting story, Oh, hold on, hold on. Oh, no, no, oh my god! Okay, actually, it picks up and goes totally insane about halfway through, but until that point, you're stuck with the baseline party. It's why I think it's kind of mandatory playing both games. A lot of the value in the characters is missable without the proper context, and that's a pretty hard sell to someone without mountains of free time. Thankfully, it's got decent comedic timing. Characters are always eating shit, and I'm too, so I find it funny. Roll the clip. You really pissed me off. I'm giving you five more seconds to live. <laughs> and it's not like the Innocent Sin characters are absolute superstars on screen. Sorry. I know I just invited the comment apocalypse. It's just the same issue as one. Caring about teenagers with kinda abnormal but believable personal issues is tough nowadays. Especially when those particular issues don't get a ton of actual time to flesh out. Tatsuya's kind of a delinquent because of his persona power. He got bullied a lot. Possibly because of that center part. Holy yikes. Ginko's mostly rebelling against her father's expectations. Eikichi's a vapid dip, just way too casually rude about overweight people, and also rebelling against his father's expectations. Expectations. They've got some stuff to work on, but it's no more compelling than Brown or Nanjo. Then they load you up with Maya and Yukino. Even weirder, right? Maya doesn't have any prevalent character issues, she just wants to stay positive. <laughs> Outdated women driver joke. Yukino's straight up from the last game, and my immediate thought is, where's the other teenagers? Maya? Yukino? This character's already had her arc. Who cares? I didn't think she belonged. That hunch was correct, about three quarters into the game. The strength in the early lull is getting to know the characters and explore the world. I think a lot of characters would be a lot stronger in games if only they had the time to talk and do. Persona 2 starts a very visible shift towards highly stylized characters. 
Ew! Environments, clean and characteristic design. It's an interesting world to discover, and you're meant to talk to everyone. The early game makes sure you can't progress multiple times if you're not talking as much as possible, so it's a world you become very immersed in. Reminds me of Twiwi, a modern supernatural spin on Japan asking for genuine intimacy with the world from the player. But enough about that, how's the gameplay? You know, it's a lot of what you do in Persona 1, but streamlined. Contact system? Easier, less annoying. You pick a character to talk to demons, instead of four interactions per character, none of which seem to make sense. Is it better? Maybe? Battle system? Mostly simplified. You don't have the gun option, your character has a weapon in their persona. You still mash magic attacks into enemies unless they're immune. The complications are largely left to personas this time, which can now combine attacks. It's pretty simple and necessary to blast through the hardest challenges, alongside potentially mutating your personas, essentially unlocking new skills and such, just for landing team attacks. Feels like there's a proper reason for the five-person party, like in the first game it kind of served the grid complication, but the grid wasn't really fun, so they axed it. Found a better answer. Not bad. This is all sounding pretty good, but hey, let's talk personas. Head over to the Velvet Room and see our old pal Igor again. And he has friends this time. Sadly, never to be seen again, except for one time at the end. See, the problem in Innocent Sin, at least for a good long chunk, is it's absurdly easy. To a ridiculous degree, but features a ton of very lengthy battles. Random encounters are too long. It's just a slow-ass game. Sometimes enemies hold you verbally hostage with conversations and there's no option to simply choose violence. Like, I'm glad they've got the auto battle option or I might have died in my chair. I don't know if that's a developer reaction to one, a game hard enough that using a guide to talk your way through whole dungeons is optimal strategy, but it definitely doesn't make for a balanced, enjoyable experience, especially not having to screw around with your personas. In Persona, I did not change from the base setup until very late in the game, which is shocking coming off one. Then they compounded the overlong battles with May like dungeon design and obnoxious spawn rate. Man, there's a dungeon that you enter via a door that you're forced to wander in a circle for like three or four times, then a cutscene triggers and the party figures out where the door is with a mirror. And normally I'd get out my gaming sin counter right here and go, the logic is farcical. But it does make sense because even if it's painful and slow and unnecessary and improbable, the whole game is about fiction blending into reality because of rumors and there's a rumor that makes it true. Oh. If anything, I'm surprised they didn't go harder with the weird reality-bending stuff until the end, because this isn't just fictional Japan, it's fictional Japan with premises. And the premise is, believable widespread rumors can become reality. I'm talking to you to spread the word as quickly as possible. Persona 2 was fun. I had fun playing Persona 2. It's fun, okay? Spread the word! It's a really neat addition, finding rumor mongers in the city, talking to them, trading info, turning it into reality at an agency that'll spread new rumors for you. For example, I got a side quest to make contact with a toilet ghost, spread the rumor, and beat up the toilet ghost for a small reward when it appeared. It's quirky. It's connecting the player to the world. So where do rumors lead the story to? Well, the party discovers that the Joker is using his squadron of colorful clan members to harvest dream energy from humans and infuse it within a series of crystal skulls to raise the ancient alien ship Shibalba, whose control is contested by... by... There is no reaction. So, actual, factual, Mayan-trained super wizard Adolf Hitler invades Japan with his army of Gundams. I mean, I need to take a break. This game hit me so hard in the face, I'm numb. Aliens? The Fuhrer? What is happening? By the end, you've recruited June, Yukino's replacement. He throws flowers and doesn't afraid of anything. Especially Ginko. Sorry, sweetie. Tatsu is canonically in love with June. Die mad. June's got a long history with the other characters. It's part of the broader mystery that drags the game along, and the innocent sin the title refers to. Basically, when the four kids and Maya were younger, they all became mask-wearing super friends because they could see each other's true selves with the masks on. It's all very symbolism. And they committed a terrible crime thought they killed Maya even though they didn't, and collectively buried the memory, departing until the events of the plot. It's a frustrating framework, there's a lot of moving parts in the story's background, and again, being part of a duology isn't a complete story by design. Feels like it should mean more, but mostly amounts to, dang, these kids had bad lives and were really stupid. They ended up ruining everything because a god was meddling with them. Pity them, won't you? There's a couple of bosses near the end, uh, statues of people in the characters' lives, like Eikichi 
has to fight a statue of his father. And June has to fight a statue of his mom. Oh, I am a clever boy, for I have pinpointed the symbolisms. And the final, final boss has you fighting them again, more or less. Yeah. Sleep well on that imagery. This is to say, a lot of the backstory is complex, but the story is not exactly graceful. I mean, we're breaking up game flow and expediency in a molasses-type game to physically spell out individual character traumas. I get it, okay? I got it when we went into the sushi bar the first time and saw Eikichi was scared of his dad. You don't... I don't need to defeat him in a JRPG battle. Man, the journey was enough to make him a fuller person. Why am I griping about this? The worst thing is that the Fuhrer was just a rumor, conjured from rumor. It takes so much punch out of the late game events that you're not really fighting his eternally persisting hell spirit. Just Nyarlathotep being a goof because he's locked in a deal with Philemon. The game's events, everything, boils down to two transhuman deities making a bet on human nature. And it ends on Maya getting stabbed by the very spear that stabbed Christ, so the wound won't stop bleeding because I guess that's a known thing. Apparently I'm not up on my scripture. So she dies for the sake of game two. How are they gonna pin this wriggling nightmare plot down into something powerful? How are they gonna shake things up? Dimensional warp, mostly. Oh, and uh... <laughs> the enemies are harder and the battles are longer. You have to summon and grind up personas constantly. And worse, you're stuck on PS2. So no PSP emulator turbo fast forward option. Persona 2 Eternal Punishment was very difficult difficult to beat, and it's a rewarding game in many ways, but it will take. And that which is taken cannot be returned. If you're a big fan of old Persona, I'm guessing this game's why. It drags over mechanics and systems, characters, setting, almost everything from the previous game. Nothing should really be amiss. Though the UI suffers a noticeable downgrade from the PSP version of Innocent Sin. But hey, that stuff's minor. I like sting games, messy HUDs, menus. We're not here to get fussed by that. It's a JRPG. We're half here for the characters. The cast is, to me, a total improvement. Maybe it's the mostly adults thing. Maybe it's because they ultimately band together to clean up the old cast's diapies, or because they're characters from the first game, from the world, so it feels like that one part of Final Fantasy II GBA where you're playing as all the temporary party members. Maybe it's because they're older people with more relatable problems. Like if Innocent Sin were set years ahead of itself, Eikichi and Ginko wouldn't be struggling with their dad's expectations. They'd be dealing with taxes and relationships, the economy, and unresolved trauma. It's some real hardcore sh** son. The common cruelties, and that's the cast of Eternal Punishment. The party shuffles a bit, but the main cast is Maya, Tatsuya, his brother Katsuya, Maya's roommate Ulala, and our savior. I mean Baofu. I mean our savior. I like characters like Baofu. He's a little coarse, looks weird, flicks coins and demons to deal damage. Mamma mia, that's what I'm talking about. Kino located, baby! And when the game's dragging, when you're finally hitting the next cutscene payoff, who's there with the plot relevance? Who's doing cool stuff when it's not the brothers? That's right, it's Baofu. This man got me through the game. So they pulled a Golden Sun Lost Age here, and Maya's gone mute. Not like she was saying much before, and Tatsuya's bursting with words. Words like, stop following me and go away. You know when you push me away, I only want you harder. The story mostly revolves around a series of escalating criminal events and various people becoming the Joker. This isn't a Twitter meme, it's really what happens. The plot starts slow, but rapidly picks up and burns hot until the end. Or it would, but this is eternal punishment. Man, I really thought I had it rough with Innocent Sin. This game, let me tell you, Eternal Punishment will kick you in the face with a boot. Eternal Punishment will roll you up and down the street in an Iron Maiden. Eternal Punishment will ask you to play Shin Megami Tensei. Where the first game was embarrassingly easy for at least half the game, Eternal Punishment demands that the player contact demons constantly, grind up persona levels with fusion attacks, replace personas every two to four dungeons, and, at times, require specific personas if you want a quality chance at success in certain boss fights. Some of that might be a little dramatic, but when you factor in that it's still Persona 2's skeleton, so slow as f except now you have to grind. I don't know how else to say this, mountains of people will never even know how sick Baofu is, and mountains of other people will have Stockholm Syndrome from playing this game. I don't want to belabor the point, and it does ease up slightly by the end. Just know, it's called what it is for a reason. The jokes just write themselves. There isn't much gameplay to talk about that you haven't heard anyway. It's all Persona 2. And I mean it when I say the game does good. A lot of the dialogue in the past game didn't really capture me, but Eternal Punishment sucker punches you with somber thoughts and ideas at random, you know. Oh. Oh, that one really hurt. Or riding the subway train. Man. 
Don't make me like you. So I ended up a lot more attached to Persona 2 than I expected. It's hard to spend nearly 80 hours totally disconnected, right? At some point you get hooked. I think it started with the blimp scene in Innocent Sin and just kept on. I got excited seeing characters from the very first game appear, even when I didn't care all that much about them then, and I enjoyed seeing where they ended up. It's that kind of thing younger and older players can probably appreciate, because unless you're totally settled in your life, you probably don't know where you're headed. Not really, and it's almost cathartic watching other people settle into their happy endings. Not that the game is terribly happy, mind you. Eternal Punishment tries to put a wrap on the first game by acknowledging that the bulk of its cast completed their arcs, but caused a world-ending problem at the end of Innocent Sin, so continues the battle against Nyarlathotep with a mostly fresh cast of Arkhavers, and pulls Tatsuya back in specifically because his center part is ending the war because he committed another Innocent Sin. Oh you. And the universe demands punishment. So at the end of the first saga, the party is given the choice to alter what is, effectively, the end of the world, but they have to choose to never have met years ago as kids, thereby creating a new timeline which everyone agrees to, except Tatsuya. He doesn't forget his memories like his friends do, so he's punished by having to grind spell cards from petulant f***head demons. So the party fights old battles, revisits old locations, the timeline plays out very similarly to the first game, and that's probably the biggest issue. It's hard to get invested in old areas you were mostly rushing through originally, especially when you're forced to grind it out. I mean, man, I am gonna pile spell cards to the ceiling and slap Igor's nose with my 30-inch stack. It even trots out Kandori, the boss from the first game, back from hell. But I gotta tell you, it doesn't have the punch, because Nanjo or Ellie from 1 are temporarily in your party here, so it mostly feels like they conjured up a relevant old bad guy for them to beat. Like, once you pulled the Hitler card, it's hard to get impressed again. Yo, they really made him Italian and called him Guido? Guido? Holy mother It's worth noting that this game's packed with extras, but I've let it take enough from me. Save your super secret personas and extra dungeons, I still need an arm to play. The story ends how you'd expect, wandering through Mega Man Battle Network and fighting evil manifestations of our characters who've all been kinda bad sometimes. It's not bad at all to be clear, if anything, watching the characters support each other with interesting dialogue lets individual characters submit a narrative negative and produce a narrative positive. Even if the issues aren't killer, the characters carry them anyway. Ultimately, the four heroes do what you'd think, and I'm left with a hollow pit in my soul wondering if any of the time was worth it, or if anyone's gonna pick up the half-hearted joke I just made. I don't hate or even dislike the early Persona games. I like and appreciate the more casual spin on what SMT was doing. I can actually drag myself through. I enjoyed struggling through the world of the original game and getting to see it evolve into a more charismatic, engaging place, somewhere I'd like to go. I think the battle mechanics were challenging and interesting, and regardless of getting held at gunpoint by demons demanding conversation, regardless of the time spent farming cards, I can say I've been there, done that with a little pride. I guess I'm just disappointed in a way, thinking these games would change my life or produce some incredible video or something, but it mostly feels like you'd expect. Another late morning, another drip of coffee, but I'm looking forward to the rest, seeing what fate's laid out for me. Catch y'all next time. Hey, it's K-Bash. Special thanks goes out to my $4 patrons, whose names are on the screen. The show's on its way somewhere good thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes out to my extra generous patrons who are... Alexa, Andy Blarg, Arch, Basement Dweller, Boha, Brios, Cal, Can I Cuss on Here? Caesar T, Cordant, Chris A, Christo009, Cody Golden, Corgi the Lad, Couch Moba, CW Glassworks, Kyle Lapreed, Daddy Dagoth, Dakota Storm Jones, Dondium, Danky Stank Swanky Make, Dara, David Castillo, Den Het, Desdemona, Dylan Coffey, 8 Bit Funk, LPO, Elsa, Annex, Aesthetico, Exa, Frankenstitch, Glyph Seeker, Guard Cory, Gucci Plant, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Harkaj, Heman Gaiman Station, Huey, Ingenious Clown, I Punched a Sandwich, Irradiated Cherries, Ice Kyle, Ivy Ruth Langley, Jason Lasky, Jaden, J. Deus, John Weber, Joke Frog, Keegan Too Cool, Clocked, Craden, Crazy Dark Chocolate, Latrix, Laundry Mom, 
Lego Sid, Lon, Lucas Boyd, Magical Madman, Mark Yulees, Maximilian Wolfgang Niver, Mike DeVR, Milky Moo Official, Mitch Elanius, Mr. Dodongo, Nairino, Nito Torpedo, Old Burgle, Old Man Cranberry, Only LK, Gaplant, PK Gaming, Quasar McDougal, Quillworth, Quinn, Reasonable Willow, Reggie Rodriguez, Sagi Trash, Siren Smells Good, Salty Smasher, Sam Vertigo, Sekai Noah Warida, Shod, Silver Bear 909, Simp God, Sleepy Wabbit, Space Lizard, Special Children, Spooky Grimalkin, Squishword, Sublime Cataclysm, Super Katsanova, Super Sandwich Guy, The Big Bubby, The Salt Knight, Thrips Heart Drop, Travis Edwards, Twiddle Chungus, V01156, Vid, Venom, Vice Pup, Viewers Like You, Vic, Walter Taggart, Waposa, Weeb Trash, Well Shit, Winter Solstice, Zanny Tanner, Yay Kundo, Young Citrus, Zachary Livesey, Zachary V, Zanasso, Zane the Impure, Zane the Pure, Zed Slayer Gamer, Zilvlin Ray, Zyberbunk. If you'd like to help support the show and make it even better, check out my Patreon. We've got all kinds of goals and lots of rewards in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.